Almost all of the reactions that we looked at so far have gone completely to the right. By this, I mean that the reactants completely have been transformed into products. Take a look at combustions, for example. If you burn some sugar, all of it is converted into carbon dioxide and water. Or if you put some magnesium into hydrochloric acid, then all of the magnesium is dissolved and turned into magnesium ions at the same time as hydrogen gas is formed. But this is not always the case. Very often in chemical reactions, the reaction may not only go to the right, but also to the left. They can go both ways. These kinds of reactions, we call them equilibrium reactions. We find them in many types of reactions, in particular in biochemical systems. Pretty much every reaction that takes place in your cells is some kind of equilibrium reaction. But there are many examples of inorganic equilibrium reactions too. Take for instance the reactions of acids and bases, and in particular buffer systems. They are all different kinds of equilibria, and we will spend a good deal of time studying them in this course. So, the equilibrium reactions are reactions that may go both ways. Let's study a simple example of such an equilibrium, a saturated table salt solution. In a saturated solution, the salt concentration is so high that no more salt can be dissolved in it. If you add more salt, it just stays in a pile at the bottom of the beaker, like this. We also write that in the beaker there's water, dissolved sodium and chloride ions, and down here we have this pile of salt. But even if we can't see anything happening to the solution with the naked eye, things do happen if we look at an atomic scale. From the pile of salt here, there are actually ions leaving the solid state, forming dissolved sodium and chloride ions like this. But at exactly the same rate that aqueous sodium and chloride ions form, other sodium and chloride ions join and form solid sodium chloride again, like this. Let's write that down too. Aqueous sodium ions and aqueous chloride ions are formed at exactly the same rate as solid sodium chloride. These two reactions, we have the reaction to the right, where solid sodium chloride turns into aqueous sodium and chloride ions, and the reaction to the left, where aqueous sodium and chloride ions form solid sodium chloride. They balance each other. And this, this means that the system is at equilibrium. Now, let's look closer at what happens when a reaction reaches equilibrium. I draw a beaker here, but wait a few moments before you copy it to your notes. You see, first I will fill my beaker with two substances here that I only call A and B. But as you can see, I pour them very carefully on top of each other so they form two distinct layers. This way, they haven't reacted with each other yet. When I mix them, they form a light blue solution like this. But when I snap my fingers like this, they react and form the substances C and D, which are red. But as you can see, the solution hasn't turned completely red. It's more like violet, which is because there's still some A and some B in it. Now you may copy the drawing to your notes, and we also write an equilibrium reaction for this. We have A plus B, and then this double arrow, or double harpoon, it's pronounced that they are in equilibrium with C plus D. We thus have A plus B that turns into C plus D. But the opposite also occurs, that we have C plus D that turns into A plus B. But what is it that actually happens when the equilibrium is reached? Let's write a small graph here, which shows the concentrations of A and B and C and D and how they change over time. When I started by mixing A and B, there was no C and D at all. You can see that down here. But now, you may recall that one of the things that affect the rate of reactions is the concentration. Right here, at the beginning of the reactions, the concentrations of A and B, which I have drawn in blue, are quite high. That means that the reaction rate to the right is quite large. Right at the beginning of the reaction, the concentrations of C and D, that I have drawn in red, are zero. Because of this, the reaction rate to the left is, of course, also zero. 
but as some C and D are formed, the reaction rate to the left starts to increase. At the same time, the concentrations of A and B decrease, which leads to that the reaction rate to the right also decreases. We can see that as we follow the concentrations forward in time. At a given time, we reach a point where C plus D is formed at exactly the same rate as A plus B. The reaction rate to the right is exactly the same as the reaction rate to the left, and the concentrations don't change anymore. The reactions to the right and to the left balance each other perfectly, and the system is at equilibrium. So, at equilibrium, the concentrations of the substances remain constant. We have this chemical reaction, A plus B is in equilibrium with C plus D, and at equilibrium, the concentrations of A, B, C, and D have stopped changing. We can express this mathematically. We write it like this, that a constant K is equal to the concentration of C times the concentration of D, divided by the concentration of A times the concentration of B. We can also write that this constant K is equal to the concentration of the products divided by the concentration of the reactants. This here, K, it is called the equilibrium constant, and we define it like this. We take the concentration of the products and divide by the concentration of the reactants. This relationship is called the law of mass action, or sometimes Guldberg and Voges law. Finally, I'll just tell you about what affects the value of the equilibrium constant for a given reaction. I want you to remember that it is only the temperature that affects the value of K for a certain reaction. I mean, for a specific reaction at a specific temperature, the equilibrium constant is constant. You can hear it from the name, you know. Which concentrations we start with doesn't matter for the equilibrium constant, and neither does the presence of a catalyst. It is only the temperature that affects the equilibrium constant for a given reaction. If you change the temperature for the reaction, you get a new equilibrium constant, but otherwise the equilibrium constant remains constant.